all that heat that was up here, you got to. Amen. I tell you this morning, as we look to the Word of God, we look to His wonderful, wonderful works that He's done for us in our lives. And as you turn this morning to Matthew, the 27th chapter, and the 51st verse, this is a message that we have brought to this church before. And it's a message that we need always bring forth on an occasion that we remember what God done for us. We look to this morning to one of the darkest times in the history of man and of Israel. You say, well, preacher, it couldn't be any darker than it is right now. Well, I can tell you it was darker than it is now because God had to do something special. Jesus hasn't come yet, but for these this time in which we speak, God had a plan. And it was so sad that God's plan depended on man to do the right thing. To honor God, to worship God, and to obey God. But we find this time that we're speaking of this morning of Israel in its darkest time, God had blessed, and as we say over and over again, he had blessed and blessed, and Israel turned away from God, turned their noses up for their blessings, and God said he must give a sacrifice. I understand this morning that Israel was certain he to give the sacrifice. But they done it to where it seemed as if it was only a tradition for them to do such a thing. It seems that it was never from the heart when they done these. This morning we see that it is the same today that it is dependent upon man. But God has a plan that was put forth in this reading this morning. This plan was the ultimate plan. It was God Jehovah. He said man could not uphold their end of plan A. So plan B. Anybody ever had plan B in their life? <coughs> you know, we're going to do this, but if it don't work, we're going to revert back to plan B. Well, I can tell you this morning that plan B was the ultimate plan. This plan would not fail because it was God himself, Yahweh, Jehovah, as he presented himself into this world in the form of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, God's only son, to be the ultimate sacrifice that man would not have to rely on man anymore for sacrifices, would not have to rely on Amen. To take their sins before God. Praise God. But that we could take ourselves, that we could come boldly before the throne of God in person via Jesus Christ. We look this morning because this plan was the plan that would last for all eternity. We see that Israel had become self righteous. In their ways. They were no longer righteous in the eyes of God because they never anymore put God first. Their God seemed to be wrong. Their God to seem to be themselves and their self righteousness. Even as they looked to the Torah, as the words that they read over and over again. It was never about them. It was about the Gentiles, how that they were so awful and how that they did not have the same God. But can I tell you this morning, this world is in the same condition today. We are a people, listen, we are a church of self-righteous people oh, Lord, yeah. with the traditions and our hearts 
of how that the traditions of man has carried on in our churches today. But I tell you this morning, there was something significant that happened on this day as we look to the first 51st verse of the 27th chapter of Matthew. Now we see that Jesus had been tried. He had been persecuted. He had been beaten. And we find that he had to carry his own cross to the Calvary's hill. And when we, what we find is when he got there, he freely gave himself to be nailed to that old cross. And to suffer for your sins and mine. We see as he was on that cross, the Bible said he had some sayings that he said, but the main one was that, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Bible says that he yielded up the ghost and listened to what happened in the 51st verse. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent from twain from top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks did rent. The significance this morning we want to look at was the veil. We find that the veil of the temple was 60 foot tall. Can you imagine it was over six times taller than this sanctuary as the ceiling is this morning? It was a big curtain, a curtain of purple and gold. And behind that curtain was nowhere that man could go. Only one man could make it behind that curtain. And it was the priest that was supposed to have purified himself. That he was the only one that could go in the presence of the Almighty God to make a sacrifice for all mankind. This morning we look to the significance of the temple being rent because this was a new way given to man by which we could go before God without going before man. This morning behind the temple we want to look of the things that has been given to man through the reading of the temple this morning for our comfort, our peace, and for our salvation. Let's go to the Lord. Father, this morning we come into your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving, Lord. This morning, dear Heavenly Father, with a heart willing this morning, Lord, to hear your word, and to be, dear Heavenly Father, obedient to your word. Lord, we know this morning there, there are self-righteous people in every congregation that's represented this morning to you. And Lord, we pray this morning that our traditions would be put to the side this morning. Lord, that you may have the freedom to run this morning in our hearts and in this church, dear God. Lord, we know that we love you this morning. And Father, we pray, Lord, as the Spirit moves this morning, Father, Lord, that we will answer, dear Heavenly Father, to the calling in which you lay on each and every heart this morning. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll go with us. Lord, that you'll, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, give us, dear Heavenly Father, the words this morning. Give us the things that you would want to be heard this morning, Lord, and bless this word. Father, for we love you this morning. And we need you like we never needed you before, dear God. And we ask, dear Heavenly Father, your presence this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We look this morning because man could never know what was behind the veil that stood. Man could only rely on what the priest would say. Only what they would read. But this morning there was so much more for man to be able to enjoy in Jesus Christ. 
And that was why the veil was rent, so that we, as God people, could go before God ourselves, so that we could find what God had for us. And that is why this morning God has allowed us to have a personal relationship with Him, that we may enjoy the things what was, it was behind the veil. And this morning we want to read one more time. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It means it was torn from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks did rent. This morning we looked at the significance of such an event that took place. Jesus said it was finished. The new covenant that God was bringing to man was complete through the death of Jesus Christ. And the significance of the temple being rent from top to bottom. Oh, it was such significance that man could not have torn it. Man could have torn it from the bottom to the top. But never could they have torn it from the top to the bottom because they could not reach it. This morning, the significance is that we need to reach Jesus Christ Amen. this morning. Amen. 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 Through His love. And the love that He had for mankind. And we read it this morning, if you want to write these scriptures down, we want to talk about the love of Jesus Christ for a moment. And in John 15 and 13, mm -hmm. these words, I want you to listen to these words this morning. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, and if you do whatsoever I command you, listen this morning. This morning God has commanded us to be obedient unto His Word. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and He said, My sheep follow me. This shepherd, when he carried his sheep out, listen, I, sometimes he would have up to 20 or 30 sheep at one time. And we know that sheep are much like church members today. We find that sheep are wanderers. And it took a shepherd to keep them confined. It kept a shepherd to keep them on the right path. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our great shepherd. And every day this shepherd would lead his sheep to a place of plenty. He would lead them to a place where they could go and they could graze. They could fulfill the bodily desires of food and water. And we find he would take them to a peace where they could lay and rest. And we find that when it was time for them to go back, this shepherd would call out there to them, and every now and then, there would be one that would like to look for greener grass, we'll say. And this sheep would wander. That's why sheep are wanderers. It seemed that everywhere there was something greater, some, something better out there. And we look today and we find that our churches are full of these wanderers. That there's always something better somewhere else. Well, let me tell you this morning, if you're looking for something better somewhere else, you will be disappointed when you get there because you bring your disappointment with you. Amen. Oh, you find, think that you found a perfect church. But when you get there for a little while, you find that it's not so perfect because of you. That's right. But we have a shepherd this morning that will keep us pointed in the right direction if we will look to him. We see that old shepherd's uh, stick that had that crook in it and that shepherd sometimes may have to grab that sheep and may have to draw it back in. This morning our shepherd is one as we read in our uh, Sunday school lesson. I believe it was last week. He chastised those whom he loves. I believe Richard brought that out, Brother Richard. And he does, but this morning we look at this great love that Jesus had for us. Uh, this morning, uh, y'all bear with me. I'm going to turn to 1 John, write this down, 1 John 4. 1 John 4. And we want to read uh, 7 through the 10th verse. And he says, Beloved, let us one love one another, for 
Love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that have he that loveth not knoweth not God, for he is love. And this it was manifested his love toward us, because God sent his only begotten Son of the world, that we might live through him. Now listen, here is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be propitiation, propitiation for our sins. This morning we find that this love, <laughs> this true love, was never found by the people of Israel in that day. They could never find this love that we can have in Jesus Christ. Every morning we have the opportunity to wake up. And every morning we have the opportunity to present ourselves before God because of His love that He had for us. Amen. This morning we find that His love He sent His Son that we might have the boldness to enter into the throne of God to make our petitions known of God. That we might make our petitions known to God. And so many times in our life we misuse this, this uh, opportunity that God has given us through His love. How many times do we wake up every morning, maybe late for work, maybe late for an appointment, maybe late for church? <laughs> and we jump up getting ready, putting our clothes on and grabbing something and heading out the door and we never darken, we never grace the throne of God. For we omit the opportunity that we have been given by God to present ourselves before the throne. To thank the God, our God. To thank Him for the night that He watched us through. For the night that He brought us through when we were asleep and had no control over our body. That He took control. I'm so glad this morning that we have that opportunity this morning to say, Lord, I love you. And dear God, I worship you with all of my heart. Lord, I praise you. I praise you, Lord, for my goodness, for the goodness and the mercy that you bestowed upon us. As David said in the 23rd Psalms, he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what will happen from that? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will never forget His goodness. I will never forget His mercy. I will never forget the love that He showed to me. And we find this morning the next thing that was behind this veil. All oh, that the people were never able to receive personally. They received it as a nation. We know that there was a great sacrifice that was made every year for the sins of the nation. And that there would be a sacrifice brought to the priest. And this sacrifice would be made unto God. And the priest would take two goats for this event. And one goat would be sacrificed and the blood would be placed on the altar of God. And the other goat would signify the sins of Israel. And that goat would be released out into the wild, into the wilderness. And there would be priests along the way that would signal the goat as it went further and further as it was released until it got out of the sight of the last priest. And then the sins of Israel would be forgiven. Today I tell you that there is no need for this great sacrifice right. for goats and bulls. We find today that there was a sacrifice made for each and every man, woman, and child that is represented here today. This sacrifice 
was not of an animal, but this sacrifice was one of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of the mercy that God had upon mankind, because mankind was in its darkest state of history, and that it could not find its way to God. So God had mercy on every man, and this mercy was found behind the veil in Psalms 103 and 8. He says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. And we find now that this was the Psalms of David, but we find now in the New Testament, this very same verse, the Bible tells us that God is long-suffering toward man. Every day God gives us a new opportunity. Instead of writing us off, God is long-suffering that none should perish, That's right. but that all should come unto Him. Amen. Should come unto repentance. Today we find that God's mercy is still available. God's mercy is still here for mankind, for each and every man woman and child today he is plenteous and he is gracious in Ephesians 2 and 1 and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins for today we find that we have all sinned Romans 3 and 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God's mercy is still plenteous. Thank you, Lord. God's mercy is still available today if we will reach out and say, Lord, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner undone, for I am a sinner lost and without hope. God, please accept me today as a sinner and I tell you that his grace grace was abundant behind the curtain because that was where the priest would go and meet God God's grace was there in Ephesians 2 and 8 we talk of grace for by grace are you saved through faith and that of not, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That grace is something this morning that we do not deserve. But because of God's mercy, He gives it to us freely this morning. If we will only ask, if we will only look to Him this morning. For I tell you this morning. This grace was given to all through Jesus Christ when He hung there on this cross that we read this morning. And when He said it is finished, this plan of grace, this plan of salvation was brought to each and every one of us this morning. Some may say, well, preacher, you know I've sinned so much and I've sinned for so long, preacher, I don't think God would ever allow me to have this mercy and grace that you speak of. Yes, he will. But I tell you this morning that He died for all. He didn't die for one, He died for all. That all might be able to call upon Him. Right. That all might receive this grace that He has given this morning. It is for by grace that you are saved. We think about that grace this morning because it is undeserved. We were yet sinners when we come into this world. And without Jesus Christ, we will be sinners when we die. And without Jesus Christ, we have no hope of eternity with Jesus. And it's this grace that He has allowed us to have 
that will lead us to an eternity in heaven. We find this morning that behind this veil there was a forgiveness. But this forgiveness was for a nation. This morning we look to this forgiveness today as a personal relationship this morning. You know there are people today that we do wrong or that wrongs us and we have a tendency to say we forgive you. But we also have this tendency to hold it somewhere back here or back here in our hearts. That we never truly forgive and we never truly forget as Jesus Christ will. This morning we find that Jesus, as he hung there, he said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And we know according to God's word, he does just that. Yeah. He said he would cast our sins as far as the east is from the west to be cast in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore. I'm so glad of that this morning. And we find that when we become God's children, that we are made in His image and in His likeness. And this morning, if we are truly made in His image and His likeness, we must have that forgiveness that God had for us as He looked upon Israel in this darkest day. He was still willing to forgive Israel so much that he gave his son to come into this world. Can you imagine Jesus Christ being born into this sinful world, not knowing sin, but he was raised by a man and a woman. And they raised him because they knew who he was. The angels had told them who he was and who his name would be and what his purpose was for coming into this world. His purpose was not to live but to die. To die for yours and my sin. Through that forgiveness that he gave on the cross of Calvary, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Mm. And today... If we are truly children of God, we must truly have that kind of forgiveness That's in right. our heart. That we can forgive even the, the most horrific sin upon us, against us, that can be given. We must forgive. And we must forget. Because this morning, that's what God did for us when the veil of the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. A new and living way he brought to us in our lives. That forgiveness we read, we want to read it one more time. I'll give you the scripture where you can find it. In Psalms 103 and 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions. In Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Wow. This morning we find that we have redemption through his son Jesus Christ. We have redemption that was for all mankind that was behind the veil. But this morning we have an opportunity to experience it personally. <clears throat> to experience it one-on-one -on -one with God. How that Jesus died with us. We find that there was something else 
that man could never obtain during this time, and that was peace. Peace with God, peace with themselves, and peace with their fellow man. It could not be had. And John 14 and 26 and 27, write these down. We find that Jesus has given us these great words in the 14th chapter. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But meanwhile, while we so adjourn in this life and in this world, he gave us a great promise. He said, I will not leave you comfortless as I go. He said, I will send a comforter unto you. But the comforter, the 26th verse says, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you this morning. He said, not the peace that the world tries to give you. See, this morning there are so many that will try to comfort you in your time of sorrow and your time of need. Even those that don't know Jesus. They will try to bring you comfort and they will try to bring peace to your life, but they don't truly know how because they don't know the true comforter. They don't truly know the one of peace that can come into your heart and into your life when you are so distraught and so much in trouble, so much in grief. But Jesus said, I know your problems. He said, I know your sorrows. The Bible tells us that Jesus went through everything while he lived here that we face in this life. He knows the pain of of death, the pain of sorrow, the pain of sickness. He knows those pains. The Bible tells us he wept over death. But he also joys this morning over death because if one of his saints dies, you are so welcomed into his beloved. There is joy this morning. We can only know peace that we can only know this morning through Jesus Christ. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, neither, neither be afraid. He said, for I know you this morning. Mm -hmm. And this morning, church, I'll tell you, he truly knows you. Amen. He knows you whether you are a child, and he knows you this morning, this morning, if you're not a child. But this morning, his desire is to give you these things. These things that are hidden to you this morning. These things that only you can truly know when you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This morning, I thought I knew joy. I thought I knew happiness while I was yet in the world. I knew the happiness of the flesh. But it's only until I come to know Jesus Christ. It was only until I come to know Him that I knew true happiness. That I knew true peace and I knew true love. And I knew the mercy and grace of God and I knew His forgiveness. It was only by coming to know Him that I could know these things. It only comes through the healing that he brought. We read in Isaiah, it says, by his stripes we are healed. That's right. This morning we want to take that so many times out of context. Mm -hmm. We want to claim healing in the name of Jesus by his stripes. But can I tell you, 
The healing that was pronounced by his stripes was the healing of the soul. Amen. It was the healing that only Jesus could bring through mercy, grace, and the peace that God wanted us to have. The forgiveness. That's by the stripes that we are healed. When we come to know Jesus Christ. But this morning I tell you that there is bodily healing in Jesus Christ. I tell you there are many examples this morning, but we want to write this down. Luke, the fifth chapter, the 19th verse we read of a people that had heard about Jesus Christ, that had heard about His healings, and how that He was touching the lame and he was making them to walk again. He was causing the blind to see, the deaf to hear. Those that couldn't talk to be able to speak again. They were hearing of these great miracles that Jesus was doing. And a group of people had a friend that was lame since birth. And they knew the faith that they had. They knew that if they could just get their friend in front of Jesus, they knew that his faith and their faith, he could be made whole. That he could made, be made whole. But as they drew near to where they heard Jesus was, we find that there were so many more that had heard about this Jesus, that was so excited to hear his teachings that they could not even come close to getting their friend before Jesus. Can I tell you this morning that behind the veil there was this opportunity for each and every one of us to present our friends, our family, our loved ones before Jesus Christ this morning without having to fight the crowd. <coughs> That we can take them before the throne of God this morning and present them to Jesus Christ. But here in this story we, we read that they could not get close. And one of them had the bright idea. Hey, let's go up on the roof. Let's really present him right in the face of Jesus. And we read that they went through the crowd and they took this man. They took him on the roof. Now I'm going to tell you something this morning. They could have very easily said, well, we just can't do it today. It don't look like we're going to be able to present him before Jesus. But yet and still, they were so set and intent on getting this loved one before God, that they took him upon the roof and they began to tear the tiles, those clay tiles. They began to remove them and they began to make a hole in the roof of this house. And I can just hear the mind of Jesus as he maybe chuckles within himself at the joy that he had over these people and how they were going out of their way to present this man before him. This morning I want us to understand that we have this opportunity to present these same loved ones, to present the lame, the deaf, the dumb this morning. And I'm not talking about the bodily Hindrances, I'm talking about those that are blind to Jesus, those that are deaf to Jesus, those that don't walk with Jesus, those that don't talk like Jesus. These are the ones we need to present before a living Jesus Christ this morning. We know He's alive. We know He died on the cross, but we know that He raised on the third day. Hallelujah. We know there is proof. You can read on down. The Bible says the graves were open. Amen. And let me tell you something. 
After his resurrection, the Bible says that there were those that resurrected with him from a place called paradise that walked through the streets of Jerusalem. Let me tell you, these were renowned people that people would recognize and people would know that there is a risen Savior because he's the only one that would go into this place and receive them and bring them out. He was the only one that could go and take the keys of death and hell and take them with him. Amen. Let me tell you, he's alive and well today. Amen. Amen. And if people don't believe it, they are deaf. That's right. They are blind to the word of God. And this morning we have that opportunity for their healing if we will take them before the throne of God and pray for their souls and ask God to continue to deal with their heart as their life goes on. For we know he is long-suffering. I can tell you he was long-suffering with this old boy right here for about 40 years. Some may have the opportunity to say more. But I want to tell you he's long-suffering and that he allows us opportunities to come to him. Amen. This physical healing, I tell you, is there. We read this morning about a church that was in trouble in Revelations, the third chapter. In Revelations, the third chapter. We read of a church. It was a church in Laodicea. And the angel of the Lord went there and he looked upon that church as God looks upon churches today. Listen to what he said. I know thy works. I know thy works. Let me tell you, God knows you from your inception to the day you die. There is nothing that is done in darkness that will not be brought out in light. God knows our works and He knows our heart. Listen to what He said to this church. And He would say that to a lot of churches today. That thou art neither cold nor hot. And I would that thou were cold or hot. He said, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, He said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, I have need of nothing. And that's where we are today, church. We live in a society in a day in which even the poorest of men in America today, the poorest families of America today, are not in need. Preacher, you, don't, you can't say that. I can't say that. I can say that today because our government is so efficient in taking care of people that don't work. We have a, a government today that is very persistent in taking care of our young ones. Food stamps are available. They send out checks. And we find ourselves today not in need of Jesus Christ because we find that we are self-sufficient in our lives. Can I tell you today, you're not self-sufficient if it were not for the grace of God Amen. that allows you to get up and go to work every day. I said go to work. I didn't say he worked. <laughs> he allows you to go to work and he allows you to receive a paycheck. We think we do it on our own. But it's not us. We don't have the ability to do anything within ourselves. Right. It is by God's grace. It is by God's healing. Listen. Listen to what he told them. I counsel thee to buy of me gold. Try and fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be enclosed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes say that thou shalt mayest see. But as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Be zealous therefore and repent. These are always the words of Jesus. Repent. Why? Because he always finds something wrong with us. The greatest Christian that's ever lived today, God has found fault. Can I tell you that? Because he says there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none righteous without the righteousness of God. Now listen why he says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now I tell you this morning, God is offering this opportunity to everyone here today. If you don't know him, this is the perfect time to know him. For he says, all that come, I will, not, I will cast none aside, I will reject none. All that come with a true heart and a true repentance, I will not cast away. This morning, this is so wonderful this morning that we serve a God. But man could never receive these things on a personal note. He had to receive it as a nation. This morning, God has opened the door that we may receive it and have a personal relationship with Him. That all these things are available to us every day, every morning when we wake. His sufficiency is there with us. We know that Paul had a thorn in his side. He prayed for God to remove that thorn. He told Paul, he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Can I tell you God's grace is sufficient in every day for every problem and every care that we have. And we're going to close with this this morning. We're going to close with another healing this morning. God has a healing for this nation. God has a healing for every nation if we would only do what He calls for us to do. We know today that America needs a great revival which will never be seen. We know that it's needed for America to ever be what it once was, but we also know that it can never happen. But we see in Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, the fourteenth verse. He gave us a remedy. He gave us a recipe for a nation if we would just turn to Him. Mm -hmm. This recipe is if my people, which are called by my name, and He's talking this morning to His people. He's not talking to the lost. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to those who He has called, to those who have called upon Him, and He said. If called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Mm -hmm. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Listen. Mine eyes shall be opened and my ears shall be attuned to the prayer that is made in this place. We read in Isaiah, his ears are always open. He's not so far away that he can't hear us. And his hand is not so short that he can't touch us. As I get a song ready this morning, I ask you if there is a need this morning. 